worked with this one, but if I get excited, I'll, I'll use the, this guy. Uh, thank you everyone for coming. Let's also thank Tao Chen for having a call by this seminar. Let's thank Mark Bellamy for accepting our time invitation to you know, see the seminar. How do you So, you know, it was Mark's paper which introduced, you know, Atari game to the deep reinforcement, the reinforcement learning community at the time. You know, as we say in machine learning and AI, we make progress by having data sets. So I think in some ways, you know, what all the good progress that we're seeing in deep reinforcement, a lot of it started with a good benchmark. Right? And, you know, Mark led that. Very nice work on intrinsic motivation and how we can you know balance intrinsic motivation more recently Mark has been working on you know distribution reinforcement learning which is exciting but you know when we work on algorithms and benchmarks we love to be stimulated that Mark you know broke out of it and he started Sort of trying to send balloons up in the atmosphere like Wi Fi, which many of you might know as the Google Loop. It's exciting to see, you know, on one hand, developing the algorithm, but on the other hand, so we are very excited to have you. And, you know, of course, Mark leads the reinforcement learning group at Google. He's an agent for AI chair. Please take it away and forward to your talk. Thank you so much for the great intro. This is a, this is a real treat to be here. Uh, I've, I've never been to Boston, let alone MIT. So this is a, a day of first for me. Uh, I'm also uh, thrilled to be missing the first snow in Montreal. So uh, this is doubly a great time to be here. Um, so over the last uh, over the last few years, um, my colleagues Will Dabney and, and Mark Roland uh, and myself uh, have been working on a book that's going to come out um, at the beginning of next year, if all goes well, on distributional reinforcement learning. So actually, we started working on distributional reinforcement learning um, about five or six years ago, and we've been really excited where we've been able to take it. And this book. Um, in some sense, is our uh, our attempt at building a more solid foundation that we can we can then all start to build on. Uh, if you're curious about the book, you can find you can find a draft of it online. You can also wait and buy it uh, in the spring. I'm sure the publisher will be very excited by this. And um, a lot of the content in the book in the talk today will actually be taken from the from the book. So if you don't see a citation, that's probably because it's in the book. So. Uh, happy to take questions uh, online or in person during the talk, so please don't hesitate to interrupt me. And if I'm running out of time, we'll uh, we'll move on. All right. So to get uh, to to contextualize where this work is coming from, maybe it's useful for me to explain one of my greatest scientific dreams, if that makes sense. My deepest dream is to build AI agents that live in these fairly rich environments. And uh, you know, through play, learn and discover about their environment. Um, so I put up two grainy pictures here of two projects from the mid 2000s that, in some sense, looked at this question. Um, the first one is a project that was led at uh, Inria Bordeaux in the southwest of France by Pierre Voudier, where they're looking at uh, creating eyeball, uh, I'm giving giving eyeball robots uh, the ability to play with their world and discover the world and, and learn about that world. And on the right-hand side is a project I was actually involved in uh, called the Critabot, which was this little comma-shaped robot whose purpose was to live in a pen and again, live and, and discover uh, about it, discover its pen and interact, eventually interact with humans or we didn't get there um, through if what you might call lifelong learning. Um, and so the core question here is, if we have this agent living in the world, one question we want to ask in reinforcement learning is what kind of predictions should it make, right? What is it trying to model? What is it trying to understand about the world? And where I'm at today is 
this belief that most of the complex systems that we think about interacting with actually have a, a large part of randomness, randomness attached to them, right? So if you're playing billiards, for example, and you, uh, you're about to take a shot, if you're like me, it's very unlikely that you can predict with 100% accuracy what's going to happen, right? There will be some kind of randomness about the outcome of your shot, even if you believe that physics is deterministic. Okay, same thing if you're driving in traffic, trying to come home after work, um, there will be an intrinsic, there will be some kind of randomness associated with the act of driving home, whether it's the time it takes or the kind of events you'll encounter along the way. And in this case, the randomness is in many ways created by other humans, other agents also trying to get home around you, right? And I think uh, more generally, if we start to look at many spheres of human activity, for example, in health, well, we can't predict everything with 100% accuracy. And so the decisions we make will uh, effectively look like they have stochastic outcomes, okay? And so the perspective here is not so much where is that stochasticity coming from, but rather recognize that it's there. And to, uh, to model it and treat it as such, okay? Now, in fact, what we know, we have studies that, uh, that demonstrated that animals in the wild do model the stochastic nature of their environment, okay? So there's this famous study on yellow-eyed juncos that demonstrated that these birds, if they're hungry, will prefer variable outcome uh, numbers of seeds. Basically, you know, they're given a choice between uh, no seeds and a very large number of seeds or a fixed amount of seeds. And if they're hungry, they prefer to play the lottery and go for that large amount that they might or might not get. If they're not hungry, then they go for that fixed amount. Okay, so put another way, their behavior in terms of the distribution of outcomes depends on their own state. And they're able to make decisions. They know that the randomness exists and they make decisions on the basis of that randomness. Now, what's interesting is that if we actually look at a large portion of the reinforcement learning work as it's happened uh, so far, um, it, it sort of mostly ignores that randomness or at least doesn't model it. Okay, so if you look at AlphaGo playing the game of Go, or if you look at all the deep reinforcement learning agents we've built to play Atari games, essentially what these models do is they just predict the expected, the expected outcome, right? The expected return to some of these rewards. And the reason for this is because we have all these great tools that we have built to learn about the expected return. And uh, it's actually interesting to ask the question, historically, how did we come about focusing so much on the expected return when we know that the world is stochastic, right? Fundamental to reinforcement learning is the idea that you have a transition function that might take you in various different places, and yet we just focus on this expected value. Um, if you go read Bellman's 1957 book, you'll actually find a sentence where, where he says, well, it's a good starting place, right? You might want to start by considering the average return. Um, and in many ways, I think we've carried this forward. What's interesting is in the same book, just a few lines down, he says, well, don't let it stop you. You know, you should do other things if you feel like it. Maybe you should model other quantities than the average return. But I think, you know, it makes sense. It was an easy starting point we, we developed the tools to learn about these expected returns. And what I want to tell you today is how we can do more than just do this, okay? And so long story short, many of the problems that uh, where I've applied deep reinforcement learning or reinforcement learning in general, when we start to model the possible outcomes that the agent might obtain, we find these are you know problems that are given to us and we have to solve them we find that there are actually rich distributions of possible outcomes um, that can emerge. Okay, and this is so, uh, you know, whether we're flying balloons in a stratosphere or playing Atari games or, or you know, playing a simulated game of uh, this is a Mujoko environment or this is a top right is a, um, an application of distributional reinforcement learning to peg insertion in an actual robotic problem. We see these distributions and the agents can learn to model them. Okay, so what I want to tell you today is, well, how do, we, how do we learn these distributions? How do we estimate them? And then why should we bother doing this, right? If we're not birds in the wild trying to survive, okay? Okay, so I'm going to actually divide my talk into three parts. Um, the first two parts are going to be more on a technical side to give you a flavor for the kind of questions that we think about when we do distributional reinforcement learning and, and sort of give us common language to think about these things. 
And then I want to spend a good amount of time talking about how, how we, why we should care about these distributions and, and how have people actually applied distributional reinforcement learning to do new things in reinforcement learning and in neuroscience and beyond. Okay, so let's get started. So um, in reinforcement learning, we model the, the world as a Markov decision process, right? This is our canonical model. And that MDP effectively looks like a game between an agent and an environment where the agent will make a choice, an action, and then receive a reward, okay? And all of this is grounded in a state. So the agent starts in a state XT, and then after choosing their action will then affect the state and there's a new state XT plus one. In the context of distributional reinforcement learning, we want to look at all of these as random variables, okay? So capital letters here will denote random variables. So we have capital X zero is the initial random state. And then we just have this, this circular loop where we generate rewards and actions and next states, okay? And really the core object is the random return here is the sum, the discounted sum of future random re rewards starting at time t zero. Here, gamma is the scalar value between zero and one, okay? So we want strictly less than one so that the sum converges. And provided that this, this interaction is random, then of course, uh, G will also be random. And I should specify in this case, we have this object called pi, the policy, and the policy will, uh, is a way of describing how we make choices, right? So the policy maps states to actions, possibly to a distribution of reactions. Um, it's going to play a very small role in the stock because for the most part, I'm just going to keep it fixed and tell you what happens. How can we learn to predict distributions of outcomes when we fix the policy? Okay, so we have this object, which is this random sum that really arises from a complex interaction between the agent and the environment. Okay, so what does that look like in a toy example? Well, first of all, let me take that loop and unroll it, right, to look at the random variables in a different way. So we start in state x0, as I said, and then you can see there's a chain, there's a chain of random variables. Uh, you know, if you, if you like graphical models, there's a, there's a way to write this as a graphical model. And to understand what this return looks like, let's look at one of the classic problems from uh, reinforcement learning called the cliff world. And in the cliff world, the agent starts in state S and wants to get to state G. G is the goal. And now we can vary that behavior. We could have a safe policy or a quick policy. Uh, I should say that if you, uh, if you walk into the cliff, there's a reward of minus one and the episode terminates. If you reach the goal, there's a plus one. And you can make this interesting by adding some noise to the environment. So this version actually has noise in it so that the wind might blow you uh, in a random direction as you're walking around. So of course, being quick is less safe because there's a, likely, there's a more likely chance that uh, you'll, you'll hit the cliff. Okay, so with this in mind, then we can actually do many, many rollouts, right? If we were to start in state S and uh, roll out this trajectory and repeatedly, and when, you know, compute a histogram of how frequently did we receive different kinds of returns. Because we're discounting, we'll receive a value between minus one and one. I think I'm unmuted now, right? All right, let's keep going. Um, and so we'll have these, you know, depending on the policy we choose, we'll see different distributions of returns. The safe one is actually going to take longer to get to the goal, but is less likely to, uh, to receive a negative reward. And you see this in a distribution where basically the distribution is more centered on lower value reward. The quick policy on the other hand, has sort of a sort of steeper two modes. Either you get there quickly or you don't. Does that make sense? Okay. So then the question is, how do we actually compute these kinds of distributions, okay? And really the workhorse of distributional reinforcement learning is what we call the distributional Bellman equation, which is, I'll start with this equation at the top, which describes a random variable in terms of a sum of future rewards. And just like in reinforcement learning, we have the Bellman equation relating expected values, we can write the same thing for random variables. So we say, that the random return from a given state X is going to be equal to the random reward plus the discounted next state random value, uh, random return. 
And I'm using this little equal D here to indicate that this is actually in distribution. So these two things are not actually equal from random variable perspective, but they are equal in distribution. Um, this is necessary to, to sort of say something mathematically proper. Okay. And uh, okay, so just to get a feel for what this looks like, really this, you know, once we work with random variables or random or distributions, the operations of addition and, and scaling by the discount factor change meaning compared to working with expected values, okay? So um, essentially when you're adding two random variables together and they're independent, you're gonna be convolving them. In this case, I've kept things simple and this is just a, a Dirac Delta random variable. So it's gonna shift the distribution. When I scale things, I'm actually squashing my distribution towards zero, okay? So the way to think about this distributional equation is I say, if I, if I convolve with the reward and then scale my next state distribution, in fact, as a mixing step also, because I have multiple next states, then I have this operations on random variables. And I say, there's a recursive equation between the distribution currently and, and this transformation of the random variable, okay? So um, here's a different way to think about this is that if I have this very complex distribution in purple, what the distribution of Bellman equation tells me is I can break it down into a relationship between the, the successive distributions uh, here illustrated in red and blue. Okay, and these themselves can be decomposed into their next state distributions. And the great thing about the Bellman equation is if we have uh, cycles in our Markov chain, then we can also handle this with the same kind of, uh, of mathematics. Okay. Okay, so uh, this is in fact, I have to say this for my co-author, Mark Roland, who will otherwise give me infinite grief. This is not actually the distributional Bellman equation, but for the purpose of this talk, I'm gonna call it such. Because it's about random variables, okay? So there's a different equation, which is truly relating the distributions of these random variables. If you're curious, you can ask me after the talk, I will try to avoid this notation as much as possible, okay? Because it's, it's a little bit more dense. All right, so uh, just to get us started, so, how do we, if we want to actually find that distribution, how do we do it, okay? Well, quick recap, if we're working in, if we're working with regular values in reinforcement learning, we would, we would define the value function to be the expected return. How much do I expect to get out of this, okay? And then uh, we can define this operation, the Bellman operator, that we then apply to, uh, to a value function, uh, to a series of value functions to eventually converge towards a true value function. And so basically what that, what that operator is doing is essentially applying those same operations we're describing to you now in expected values and in expected value sets and repeatedly doing so until we stop, we stop the process or until we stop moving. And the fundamental result we have is that this process is a contraction mapping. Uh, Long story short, if I measure the distance between V pi, which is the true expected return, and my iterate at time k plus one to what I had at time k, I'm gonna see that it's contracting in specifically in the supremum norm. Uh, so this, the maximum distance between any two states. Um, I like to look at this picture instead, which is really showing you that every time you apply these operations, you're going to get closer and closer to the true value function at a rate that's gamma, okay? now. The good news is that the same argument can be done in distributions if we're careful, okay? So we can define from the Bellman equation, we can define a random variable operator, which takes in as input a collection of random variables. And then we construct a new collection of random variables after applying these operations. And we keep repeating this over and over and over again, okay? And, um, you know, the good news is that we can have the same kind of contraction result in that, uh, in, in, a, in a between probability distributions, okay? And I'm showing this to you because in some sense, this is saying, this is a process that is justified, right? So we start with the, we start with some initial condition and then we keep applying our, uh, our set of operations. And at some point we converge to an actual, the, the actual distribution of the returns, okay? I'm gonna show you a concrete example in just one slide. Okay, um, so in the context of distributional reinforcement learning, how you measure distances matter, right? So if you're dealing with scalars, it typically doesn't matter very much how, you know, how close is this thing to this thing, whether scalars just take the difference. When you're dealing with probability distributions, you have to be a bit more careful 
So one thing that we often, the, the, main, the main tool we use is the Wasserstein distance. In the context of this analysis, this is going to work. Sometimes we need to use something else, okay? So what is the Wasserstein distance? It's essentially comparing the, uh, the distributions by measuring the area between their cumulative distribution functions, okay? And if you know about this, these Wasserstein distance, I appreciate this is a very toy version of the Wasserstein distance, but this, this works for us, okay? Um, all right, so let's, oh, what is this? Uh, there's a presenter view. I'll go back to my talk. All right. So at this point, just to recap, we have a random return. And it's basically the thing we would get if we did multiple rollouts. And we, we measured from these rollouts how much return we get, okay? It's, it's the random variable describing this. And what the distributional Bellman equation allows us to do is to essentially relate the return at one state with the return next state. Now, the problem is that even though we have this nice procedure for uh, that, that, you know, we repeat those operations and in mathematics, in theory, we would converge, it's not really practical, okay? And basically, the main challenge here is that probability distributions are essentially infinite dimensional, right? So how are you going to store this in memory, right? Well, you're going to need to make some assumption. And uh, you saw some distributions earlier, almost always when we've used distributional reinforcement learning, making a Gaussian assumption isn't enough, right? It's not going to get you all the way. So we want to think about using richer representations of distributions to do this, okay? There's actually some, some you know, many problems you can think about just to put one on the table, uh, even if you didn't have, I mean, in some sense it's related to this, but even if you don't worry about memory, you will have to worry about memory because uh, computing this return distribution exactly is NP hard. Okay, so that, that suggests that we have to do something. So the result, the, the idea is going to, we're going to approximate distributions and we're going to see how far we can go with one approximation. Okay. So uh, let me introduce to you the categorical representation. Essentially, we start with the probability distribution on the left-hand side, which is the, the ground truth. And what we want to do is we want to use a finite number of parameters to represent that distribution. All right. Now, a simple thing you can do is what some people would call a histogram representation, okay? Where you're going to have a fixed number of, of categories. This is what we call a categorical representation or items. In this case, minus two, zero, two, and four, and six, there's five of them. And we're going to assign probability to these five uh, locations on the basis of the original ground truth, okay? Um, so it is in fact a projection in the, 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 the real sense. So how do we do this? Well, the way we can do this is with a simple rule to say, I start with my gray distribution, and now I'm going to assign mass in proportion to their distance to the nearest location, okay? Um, and this process will effectively correspond to uh, convolving uh, with, with hat kernels, if that makes sense. So this is what this thing is showing on the right-hand side. So each of the locations, these are theta one to theta five, will capture some of the probability mass in a cone around it, okay? And so now the idea is that we're going to apply this projection to keep memory bounded, okay? And we're gonna keep doing this to keep memory bounded, okay? So in fact, if we think about these operations that allow us to, compute, to, to, to operate on distributions, okay? So we have the three operations of indexing, scaling by the discount factor and then adding the random reward. Now we're going to add a fourth step, which is to project back onto the support that the project back into the, the, the representation class that we start from, okay? So again, we're going to compute a return distribution using these four steps repeatedly. Yes. Maybe a quick question. So, so if you have a sequence of such projection operations, that yes. the approximation can worse and worse with how many times you project. So is that something that becomes a big problem? Right. So that's actually, uh, so the question is, is, is error going to accumulate as we, as we iterate over this process? The answer is yes. I don't have that slide here for time, but in short, we know 
what the error looks like in the context of this representation. Um, because as you as you're thinking, right, if I start with a fixed, if I know that I need infinitely many parameters to describe my distribution, something is getting lost. And now, if you if you cut out some parameters early on, then in fact you'll suffer additional error that you would not have had if you hadn't done this. Yes, so in the context of this method, we're assuming that we have a fixed and known support. There's ways to deal with it if, you're, if your true distribution isn't uh, on that support. That's okay, you can always, there's actually, you see it in the plot here. The, the, tail, the tail locations capture all the distribution on the left for the lowest one and uh, the right for the highest one. The, then you can have a really bad approximation. Uh, so I, the short answer is that there are other ways you can do this process that will not suffer from this issue, but they have other challenges. I'll come back to this in a few slides. Okay, any other questions? I promise I have a video showing up in a few slides, so hold your breath. Ah, there it is. So here, great. So this is actually just putting everything together. Uh, this is what we call categorical dynamic programming. Okay, so let's go back to the cliff, the cliff word we were looking at earlier. Here, what I've done is I've labeled different states with different colors. I apologize. I don't know if this is a colorblind, colorblind friendly scheme. Um, and what you're seeing here is the process of learning, or sorry, computing an approximation of the distribution of the return at all of these states, right? Um, and what you can see initially, the, the initial condition is sort of a uniform distribution over, over these atoms. And as we perform repeated iterations, what's happening is that we're propagating the computation from the goal state backwards, okay? And you can see, for example, the goal state has all of its mass on the reward one because you're at the goal, so you will get there for sure. And when you get closer to the start state, then you see that bimodal outcome appearing because there's more and more of a chance that you will hit the negative one as you go along, okay? Um, and so you can improve the accuracy of this method by using more locations, right? So this is a parameter M that we can use. Uh, the cost will then be linear. So each iteration will have a linear cost in terms of number of locations that you have, okay? So this is a way to compute the return distribution approximately. Okay, um, so if you like theory, then you can do things such as characterizing how quickly we converge to this approximation. Uh, and you can also characterize how accurate this approximation is. Okay, and uh, if you're familiar with this kind of bound, these will look somewhat vaguely familiar, but they're also a little bit different. So uh, there's gonna be a factor one half here that is surprising and comes from the analysis technique uh, because to understand this approximation, we actually need a different kind of distance between probability distributions called the Cromer distance, okay? But the good news is that this is a sound procedure for approximating these distributions, and it's going to scale, the approximation error is going to scale with the number of particles you use, right? So that parameter M, so that's a good thing. And we can stop the process and know when we should stop the process. Um, all right, so, um, this is a really fast overview of how do you compute approximate return distributions. There's a ton of other ways in which you could choose to represent your distributions if you don't like histograms. Okay, so two that we've used successfully is quantiles. And I like to think of this as a transpose of that histogram. So instead of having fixed locations and variable probabilities, you would now have um, variable locations and fixed probabilities and uniform probabilities. And, and the good news, you know, there's, there's good reasons to use this and there's bad reasons to use this. So if you're curious, you can, you can ask me after the talk or we can dig into it later. Um, in practice, I think learning quantiles has been a bit more successful when one thing is exactly because you don't need to specify the support ahead of time, because now you will adjust your quantiles according to where your data is actually, actually is, okay? Um, there's more exotic methods you can use such as expectiles, which actually come from uh, economics, actually so do quantiles in our case. 
uh, they are more smooth, they are more stable in some sense than learning quantiles, but there's additional machinery you need to use to learn them. Okay, but all this to say, if you don't like histograms, you can go back and choose another one of these methods or make your own. You could use mixture of Gaussians, for example. Okay, so, um, all of these examples I was showing you earlier were obtained effectively by this kind of dynamic, dynamic programming process that I was showing you, okay? With one difference is that we're now learning from samples. So I should say, if you don't have access to a full model of the environment, you can still go ahead and learn these distributions um, as we would do with say, for example, temporal difference learning for learning the expected value from sample transitions. We can also do categorical temporal difference learning and learn the distribution from samples. In practice, actually, this is what we do most of the time because we would just have data and not an actual model of the system. Okay, um, and so you have here, you know, the, the top left is a, an actual quantile representation. So this is when we, we, we flew these balloons, we found that in fact, uh, in simulation, we predicted fairly non, uh, you know, non-Gaussian distributions of possible outcomes. Um, for example, if your balloon might be blown out because of bad wind conditions, they're gonna show up as a long tail of possible outcomes. Um, as I said, at the top right, this is a mixture of Gaussian approach. This was the peg insertion problem by my colleagues at DeepMind. Uh, and they found also that in a problem, often they'll see this bimodal structure where maybe they succeed, maybe they fail. Okay. All right. So um, let's jump to applications. And the first thing I want to talk to you about is risk sensitive control. In risk sensitive control, what we do is we say, well, if we have the distribution, we should really try to, we, we, we could think about optimizing for a different criteria about this distribution than just a mean value, right? This is a very sensible thing to do. For example, if you want to minimize your losses. Um, so effectively, risk sensitive control just wraps the random return in, uh, around a function called a risk measure. And we try to optimize for this. Okay, it's actually an incredibly rich field of research. Um, what I'll say is that where distributional RL plays a role here there's all these criteria that exist that have been developed either in economics or also in reinforcement learning, extended reinforcement learning. What we get with distributional reinforcement learning is the ability to compute those distributions uh, almost independently of the risk measure you're using and then separate the prediction problem from the control problem. Okay. Um, okay. So I want to tell you about a specific example of this, which is called Q2Opt and it's risk sensitive. Uh, it, it's, a, it's a grasping robot. Um, this is work that was done at, uh, at Google X and at Google. And in this task, they have a robot that's trying to grasp various objects, okay? And this is done from vision. Um, the, specific, the specific reward structure has a discount factor and uh, a per step penalty, okay? And they were doing offline RL. Now, even though this is, again, sort of a reasonably deterministic system, when you model the distribution, you find that the a fairly complicated distribution of possible outcomes arising from all kinds of noise in a system, right? Noise at randomness, for such as, for example, the dynamics of the sensors or the function approximation. And, uh, and so these folks were interested in finding out, can we do better with risk sensitive uh, reinforcement learning? And what's interesting is that if you just turn on the distributional part, then yes, you do better, but you can do even better by then taking the learned distributions and acting on them According to either a risk, well, according to a risk averse criteria. In fact, they tried a bunch of risk criteria, either risk seeking or risk averse. And this is a success rate, as you see. And the best success rates are obtained when you ask the grasping robot to be a little bit risk averse. Okay. And, you know, there's good reasons for this. I think my favorite plot from the whole paper is that the authors went in and measured the number of broken robot grippers that, that happened during the, the evaluation trials. Okay, and you know, is this, is this statistical evidence? I don't know, but I love this graph. What they found is that everywhere where the robot was being risk seeking, they found more broken fingers. And as you, as you make the robot more risk averse, actually, the, you know, you're breaking fewer fingers. So what might be happening here? Well, the robot, even though it doesn't know why the world is stochastic, it can still act and be careful. Right, and try to be more careful in grasping objects, possibly breaking fewer fingers. Okay. Um, I just found out actually a few days ago that AlphaTensor from DeepMind also use 
uh, risk sensitive policies, in this case, a risk seeking policy to generate more diverse candidates for their matrix multiplication algorithm. So this is a pretty neat use of the, of the framework, which uh, I didn't know until recently. So, okay. So the second application I want to tell you about is deep reinforcement learning. And this is really where things started. So in deep reinforcement learning, we map our images to, uh, in this case, a Q value, basically predicting the expected return. And we choose an action on the basis of that expected return, okay? So when we add distributions to deep, and then the, the stuff in the middle describes a deep neural network that is transforming these raw inputs into a, an expected return, okay? So what's nice about the distributional approach is it's really just replacing that last prediction by some distributional parameters, and then hopefully downloading an open source package that does the algorithm for you, um, or emailing me, but that's a much slower, that's a much slower path. So, so we have the, you know, we can predict the distribution, embed this in a deep reinforcement learning setting. And then what's very surprising is that just making that change, but still ask it, act, acting in a risk neutral fashion with respect to the expected value actually improves performance. Okay, and I won't go too deep into these results for time, but essentially, uh, you know, all over Atari, when we do this, we find better performance, okay? Even though we're acting in a new risk neutral fashion. Um, same thing, you know, I talked to you about the Q2 up result already, and you know, they're just turning on distributions made a difference. And you found, you know, a number of people in, in uh, doing robotics from vision have actually found this in a variety of papers. We found this, of course, working with uh, our, our balloons uh, with Loon. Um, so this is very surprising, right? We're not changing the criteria. We're just predicting more things, okay? We actually had some fun when we applied distributional RL to the game, the card game Hanabi. I don't know here who, who has played Hanabi who knows about Hanabi. It's a partially observable multiplayer game. And it's one of these projects where at first we were not getting DQN to work and we were getting disappointed and discouraged. And then we turned on the distributional part and realized, wow, this actually learns to play Hanabi. Um, I don't have the slide for this, but I know the folks at uh, Sony and UT Austin, when they applied DeepRL to play Gran Turismo, they also found that distributional reinforcement learning gave them a boost. Okay. So um, to me, this is a very deep and interesting question. Why does this make sense, right? We're not using, we're not using anything but the expected value, yet those predictions make a big difference. And it really goes back to this idea that if your system is fundamentally random and, and this randomness exists, we should learn about it and have a richer state representation that, that understands um, that the fact that the world is random. Now, I appreciate this is quite vague. We've done a number of works or we're trying to explain this and elucidate this. And I think this is still in some sense an open question to explain this properly, okay? Okay, so, um, this is this is exciting in the sense that you know this is a very classic. Here's an algorithm; it improves performance. And sure, that's nice, but um, it, it maybe isn't as game changing as we would want it to be. Uh, now, where distributional RL has been applied that makes me very excited is in uh, understanding the brain and computational neuroscience. And so, just as a recap. Um, since the mid 90s, we've had this hypothesis that uh, the dopamine neurons in the brain encode a form of uh, temporal difference error, right? So what's the classic, uh, the classic result by Wolfram Schultz and, and co-authors is that if you have monkeys uh, play one of these games where they have, to predict, they have to predict the light and get a reward when they do so, um, and the top panel, you see what happens early on when they're not used to this task and they, the, the neurons, so that the rest of the plot shows how much the neurons are spiking in a given time interval, okay? And you can see that after the R, which is the reward, the neurons will spike and say there was something unexpected here, okay? And after a while, when they've trained, now the dopamine neurons stop responding on the reward, but they now start responding on the stimulus, indicating that they're about to, you know, predicting the reward. And so there's a classic, classic hallmark of, uh, of temporal difference learning, what really sort of clinches the argument here is to say, if you now remove the reward, you still get a positive error at the conditional stimulus, okay? But you, you see a decrease in prediction, so a negative TD error in some sense, 
when the re when the reward does not appear, right? So you can really see that this these neurons are modeling a positive and negative signal that seems to be based on value prediction error. Okay. Now, uh, you know, this was the model for a while. This is a very exciting model to think about. Now, there was data from uh, now Achita's lab at Harvard um, from a few years ago that was collected that was looking more in detail at individual dopamine neurons. Okay. And uh, well, if you collected a population of neurons and you expect that they oper operate under the TD model, what you would expect is that they roughly, if you, if you change the magnitude of the reward that, in this case, this is with mice, if you change the magnitude of the reward that the mice are getting, these neurons should basically respond roughly the same way. So what you're looking at here on the left is a plot of uh, in a normalized sense, how much are these neurons responding to varying magnitudes of reward where blue is the smallest amount of reward and, and red is the largest amount of reward. Okay, so this is a task where the mice are receiving a random reward of varying magnitude. And you expect that the, if you sort the neurons by their, uh, you know, if you sort the neurons as is done here, they roughly all look the same, maybe with small noisy deviations, right? They respond negatively to small rewards and positively to big rewards with about the same reverse, reversal point where they change the sign of their response. But actually, if you look at the data, the data is much more noisy. And uh, more importantly, what you find is that some neurons are optimistic. They, they seem to fire positively almost always. Uh, and, and you know, even when the reward is, um, how to explain this? Even when the reward is much smaller than the mean, they'll still react positively. And conversely, you have other neurons that seem to, um, to fire more pessimistically, okay? So no matter how big the reward is, they encode almost always a negative error, okay? And one way you can actually explain this, and this is work by my colleague, Will Dabney, is if you think that these neurons actually encode a distribution of outcomes, as opposed to, uh, as opposed to just a TD error. Okay. And specifically, what you can do, the analysis that they've done, is to um, use one of these, um, uh, to use what's called the expectile temporal difference learning algorithm, and relate the firing rate of these neurons to ETD. Okay. Um, this is a bit technical, but long story short, what the way that ETD works is by having a step size, a learning rate, that is different whether the neuron is, uh, the reward is less than expected or more than expected. And essentially, if you, you can go and, and experimentally measure the, 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 the dopamine neuron step size, and you find that indeed they have this asymmetric step size. So, so some neurons, actually not only do they have the asymmetric step size, but it varies from neuron to neuron. Some neuron uh, have a very small step size for positive outcomes and a very big step size for negative outcomes and vice versa. Okay, so if you're curious, you can go take a look at the paper for more details. Um, so I think there's a lot of folks in computational neuroscience that are very excited about this. Um, Chris Gagné and Peter Dayan, for example, have a paper from last year where they're arguing that uh, behavioral uh, changes such as anxiety or, or the gambler's fallacy, you can view them as byproducts of being risk sensitive in, in sort of an extreme way, right? If you just focus index on the on the pessimistic tail of your distribution that you've, you've estimated the right distribution, but now you index on the wrong part of the distribution, then that could be an explanation. Um, I know that Matt Botvinnik also has some exciting work uh, that he's told me a little bit about where they're looking at major depressive disorder and trying to understand this from the distributional reinforcement perspective. Um, and of course, in some sense, uh, you know, if we know that those birds are behaving in a risk sensitive manner, we should expect that their neurons encode risk, right? That they actually reflect that distribution. So, um, so that's to me is very exciting to understand where we're going. What what can we do uh, if we believe that dopaminergic neurons are encoding distributions? Okay. Um, really, the last thing I want to talk about in one slide is to show you that you can do a lot more with distributional reinforcement learning than just. Uh, you know, just play games basically. So this is work that my colleague Mark Rowland is working on where um, he wants to use distributional reinforcement learning to analyze randomized algorithms, okay? So 
Recall that when you, uh, you know, the randomized quick sort, sort algorithm, as it's showing you on the screen here, will pick a pivot at random. You're trying to sort a list of integers or numbers. You pick a pivot at random, and then you perform a partial sort around this pivot, and then you recurse, okay? And so uh, you can actually write down the runtime of this algorithm as a recursive distributional equation, okay? Where Zn here is the, uh, the total runtime of the algorithm, okay? Then you have the partial sort here, which is n minus one, and then you have the recursion. Okay, so this is not, this is the same kind of equation as we had before for the distributional Bellman equation, but now it's for the time of, a, of an algorithm, right? Um, and so other folks have actually computed the limit distribution of the runtime. It has this form here, it's a distributional equation. Um, the exact terms don't matter too much. <clears throat> What's interesting is that this is of course an infinite dimensional object. So now can we approximate it with tools from distributional RL. Well, we can, okay? And so uh, if you're familiar with quicksort, you know that it has an average runtime of n log n. It's also known that this runtime concentrates around that mean. So in other words, it's very unlikely that you get a really bad outcome where you spend uh, a very long time sorting the array, okay? Now with categorical dynamic programming, we can actually go in, or, or quantile dynamic programming, we can actually go in and get that runtime exactly. So this is the actual distribution of what runtimes for quick sort, just being visualized. This is a normalized version where uh, given by this equation here. Um, and you can see, as you might've expected, it is tightly concentrated around the mean. So one, this is a one deviation away. And uh, of course the, the, the left side will be bounded because there's a minimum runtime to quick sort, just if, even if you were as, as lucky as you could be. Uh, and then you know, there's gonna be a wider tail on the other side if you're unlucky. Um, so that's actually very exciting and we'll see where that work goes. All right, so uh, the takeaway message for this talk is that we have these computational tools for learning about distributions the same way that we have computational tools for learning about expected returns, okay? And you know, if you, if you think about this in terms of dynamic programming, this is in some sense bigger than reinforcement learning. And so, uh, you know, my challenge to you is why should we not just use this all the time? Why not just substitute in wherever we're learning expected values in a dynamic programming fashion? Why not just learn distributions as the first, the first class citizen? Okay, and certainly for us, it's paid off and we found all kinds of new ways to apply these ideas. So on this note, uh, I'm done. This went by way too fast. Uh, thank you for listening. Please. Hi, Fraser. Um, so generally, when I think of uncertainty in value functions, I think of two core sources. One is incomplete value, when it just have years related to value that not coming up. And the second is true stochastic environments. So you focused on the second one. Does distribution RL also help with the first one, or do we need to build something on top? Right. So uh, let me rephrase the question a different way. Do we want to separate what people would call epistemic uncertainty from the uh, sort of ground truth uncertainty we can't get rid of a stochasticity? Um, I mean, in short, the computational tool is the same, right? So you could go ahead if you if you if you had um, if you knew that epistemic uncertainty, you could then use dynamic programming to percolate through and deal with it. I think one challenge is if you have both sources of uncertainty, we haven't really figured out how to and it disentangle these two things. Um, so certainly I think that's a very interesting question. And one perspective could be, I don't care where it's coming from, I'll just model it and see where it goes. I think maybe that's 90% of the answer for me anyway. Going beyond, I think is a really great, a really great question. Please. Um, so you can, I think you would need another, you would need another objective to optimize. Um, I haven't seen this done. I'm just trying to remember. I feel like I saw this last week, but I can't remember where. Uh, so, uh, one challenge with 
these kinds of approach often is to you, you, you sort of top level optimization has to be fast enough then it's not always playing catch up with level optimization. But if you can find a way to do it, it'll be very interesting. Please. Um, let's say between 50 and 200. Um, there is, of course, a computational cost to using more. Uh, if you're using, say, a GPU, uh, that cost is actually minimal. Also, if often other parts of the process are slower, whether it's moving the data around or um, but that's the answer. I think if you go to a thousand, then you start running into computational questions. Um, I... In the framework of distribution, are that someone wants to do research in this area? What would you say are some important collections? Mm. Uh, I realize I should be repeating the questions as well. So in the framework of distributional reinforcement learning, what are some open questions? Um, I guess we wrote a whole book about this. So uh, this is this is the cheeky answer is go read the book. But, um, you know, well, first of all, I think the question of why, the question of why or how it should help in settings where we don't think it should be needed for example, I, I really like this question of why, why is it useful in robotics? You know, and it, I don't think actually that this specific method did this in a very smart way, right? Like they just learned a distribution and acted risk averse and they tried a bunch of configurations and said, this one works best. And that's not completely satisfying. But I love the fact that, yes, as a human, I think I, I, when I come to novel situations, I'm going to be risk averse. You know, I've never been in this building. I will probably take a bit longer to, to navigate and, and, you know, not run so fast. To, so, you know, disentangling this from partial observability and how we deal with partial goal problems, I think is interesting. That's just one specific thing on the sort of more applied side. Um, I think from a computational perspective, we, you know, we have a bunch of algorithms we can use. And these are nice because they're open source. You can download them. But really, we haven't given that much thought to what is the right shape of representation or are there different ways we could represent these distributions? This is more sort of more theoretical, more fundamental, but uh, you can propose your favorite distribution and go run with it and see what gives. Um, the challenge is then, and you can sort of see this if you go through the book is, can I prove that it converges? Can I get an approximation error bound, right? Can I, uh, does it even work? Um, so this would be a different line of research. Uh, and of course, if you do neuroscience, then understanding the neuroscience of it is, is also fascinating. That was a fascinating yes. Any questions from the online audience? Yes, hi. Um, I put this in the chat, but I think it's going to be easier to say this out loud. Um, so, you touched on it a little bit with different types of uncertainty, but can you comment about um, any thoughts you have on using the uh, actual distribution in order to inform a exploration policy? Um, in addition, just to like risk aversion, specifically how to get around this sort of chicken and egg we have in RL of sampling bias as a result of the policy, but as a result of the sampling bias of states, our policy is then confused. Um, yeah, so, so one answer to the question of how do we explore with these distributions is maybe to look at what Alpha Tensor just did. Okay, so it's in a very different space, I think, that people don't normally think of it this way. But the fact that Alpha Tensor found it useful to be risk seeking, right? they're in a very different setting in some sense where they're trying to discover algorithms. So the search space is never ending, right? You can always look for new matrix multiplication algorithms. So maybe that's, that's food for thought. Um, Otherwise, the more classic approach of trying to use distributional RL to, to learn about epistemic uncertainty is good. But uh, I feel like the naive answers here have been tried and didn't work. So maybe we need to be smarter. 
Okay, thanks. I, uh, this is leaping here. I get another question. So um, talking about the risks for versus reward. So it is it possible I can factor risks uh, risks into the reward function and then use the traditional methods. Or if I talk about the advantage of distributional RL, is it because you have like two numbers? One is risk, the other one is uh, reward. And then I can check the two numbers and say that, oh, this is the maximum risk I can accept. And then upon that, I, I maximize my reward. Right, right. It, it is the reason you can do like, uh, you can better handle like risks comparing so to traditional method. Yeah, so let me unpack this a little bit. So if I understand correctly, you're saying, can we, can we basically have a number of criteria, one measuring expected return and one measuring maybe risk and then go ahead with this. Um, you know, here's, a, here's a, the most simple version of this is, uh, I learn about the mean and the variance, and then I maximize the mean minus the penalty for variance, right? Um, so you can do this. In fact, it is one of the risk criteria that I mentioned um, that I can maybe bring back up. Um, the challenge is that it's actually quite hard to optimize this criteria. And in some sense, what I would say is that the variance is a bad surrogate for risk. For example, variance can mean that you have a chance of winning the lottery. Well, that's not a bad risk, right? That's the kind of risk I want to take if there's no downside. Um, so, so that's why all these other risk measures exist and why there's, you know, there's a whole cottage industry of, of producing these and it's a very interesting topic. Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm happy to keep answering questions. I don't know if we have time for one more, maybe. Right. So, so let me see if I understand the question correctly. So, if we, if I have the whole model of the environment, why bother learning the distribution? Is that right? Well, okay. So, in some sense, that that algorithm I was showing you, this categorical dynamic algorithm, the dynamic programming algorithm, is requires the model of the environment. But just like we still find it useful to do dynamic programming to to compute the expected return for a given policy or for the optimal policy, I think this. I mean, this is the process of. Uh, as Leslie was telling me earlier, compiling the description of the MDP into the thing you care about, which is the distribution of the returns. So you start with the description of the MDP, it doesn't tell you how you should be acting. Now you crunch the numbers through and now you have your answer. Uh, in some sense, you do this pre-computation so that when you're done, you can read off in big O1 the distribution of a given state as opposed to having to do rollouts, if that makes sense. Uh, yes. I guess since we're learning the distribution of returns, we're modeling a lot of different things um, rather than just learning the expected return. So, are there any sorts of trade offs here in some sense? Like, um, is it harder to model a more accurate distribution of returns versus an accurate expected return? Um, yes, so if you have if you have a finite number of parameters and you don't learn the mean with one of them, then it's very likely that your estimate of the mean is worse. Uh, then you can study some trade-offs depending on how you've chosen to do things. We have some bounds, in fact, in the book that look at this specifically. Maybe we should release the rest of the folks yes. before it's... Uh, Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody online.